Thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. My name is Laura Clemens, I'm Director of Operations at Greystone, and I'll be going over some housekeeping items before we begin this afternoon's presentation. After the presentation, we'll take questions from attendees. To ask a question, please use the toolbox on the right side of the screen. And due to the size of the attendance, Attendees will be in listen-only mode to cut down on background noises. And there will also be a short survey at the end and we would appreciate your feedback. Now I'd like to welcome our speakers today, Bryce Cannon, President of Modia, Christopher Newharth, Vice President of Experience and Digital Innovation at Children's Wisconsin, and mediating Q&A will be Brian Palmer, Director of Marketing at Modia. Welcome everyone. Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> All right, Christopher, I guess we can jump in here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, like uh, Laura mentioned, I'm Christopher Newharth. Uh, I lead experience and digital innovation here at uh, Children's Wisconsin. So you hear hear me kind of mention probably a little bit of both roles as we as we go through the presentation today. Both kind of how um, how we what customer research led to this app, but also um, how we went about building, which I know a lot of you are interested in, probably in similar roles as well. So that's where that's where Bryce came in <laughs> to, to help us out with that. So. Yeah, thanks, Christopher. And, and uh, Bryce Cannon, president at Modia, uh, as Christopher sort of alluded to, we worked pretty closely in, in sort of defining, helping define the vision and ultimately realization of, of the app that we're going to talk about today. And uh, in my role specifically, I, I really oversee the majority of all of our consulting operations that, that we that we do in, in working with our clients across the, the healthcare industry and also um, generally sort of oversee our healthcare strategy practice at Modia. So excited to be here and to share some of the work that we've done with uh, Christopher and our friends at, at Children's Wisconsin. <clears throat> Uh, so, just in terms of what we're going to cover here today, and Christopher, feel free to chime in with any anything I miss here. But generally, I think what what we want to do is is talk a little bit about first and foremost what drove the plan and the strategy here with with the mobile application for Children's Wisconsin. Um, part of that's going to be just some general research and and things that we knew were happening in the industry that drove. The decision making here and then Christopher's going to share a little bit more specifically about what's happening at Children's Wisconsin and and some of those um, things that led to the the direction and, and the strategy for this product. Uh, we're going to get a bit into the execution, how we did this and what were some of the kind of key decisions and factors that played in as we decided where to go with the technology, the features and functionality and ultimately the, the launch and rollout plan. Um, and then there were some things that didn't go perfectly. So we're going to hit on some of that and just things that we think would be helpful takeaways going forward um, for anyone that is already starting this process or is considering building a product like this um, and integrating with their with their electronic health record system or their patient portal. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully that's some sort of useful takeaways for everyone here that's, that's joining us. <clears throat> So just, just to get us started here at the highest level, I'm gonna spend a, a brief few slides just talking about some research and things that we've learned uh, that, that helped contribute to the direction and the strategy for this app specifically, and also was just a good sort of, I think, counterpart, Christopher, to a lot of the research that you all had done in-house. In um, so <clears throat> specifically just hitting on a few um, Things that we learned from talking to consumers generally across the U.S. Uh, about mobile specifically, and, and trying to understand just some what are some of the trends going on from a from the, the customer or the patient's point of view. So just a little bit about what this looked like. Uh, so this is Modia uh, proprietary research that we did um, last year that again was focused on mobile, and what we did was we sourced. Uh, almost 600 US-based consumers for the focus of really talking about how they're using mobile and just trying to learn you know, what was happening currently with their mobile usage, but also how things had sort of changed post, post the, the pandemic or during the pandemic, I guess, really when we, when we did this research. Um, and a couple of just sort of demographic things here, uh, we, we really wanted a, a set of um, users here or consumers that are, regularly seen a, a doctor just have a, a fairly 
connected relationship with their provider or their provider organization. Um, and we also heard through just po polling and, and understanding who this group was that pretty significant percentage were actively doing some amount of care and health management using mobile device. So, um, pro you know, bordering on a more tech, tech savvy group here, but a, a decent distribution of those who don't really use uh, mobile devices or technology a ton to manage their health versus uh, quite a few that, that really do. <clears throat> uh, so one of the things we wanted to understand out of the gate was just, you know, what are the things that really drive people uh, to adopt and, you know, leverage a mobile app or a mobile device in general to manage their their uh, healthcare relationship and um, all the tasks associated with that. And so what we heard um, was not super surprising, but I think helped really steer the focus of the initial feature set for the app and even where we've continued to focus most of these sort of efforts um, on an ongoing basis. Because really, you know, the things that stood out were uh, folks are looking for convenience first and foremost. They're looking for something that's pretty, pretty simple, easy, and just helps them get things done um, as they're trying to complete tasks or do other fairly transactional things on their mobile device. Uh, one interesting thing that came up here was just the importance of security. So, you know, that we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of lo logged in feature set and just really leveraging the patient portal technology to make sure it is really secure. And we're considering data and and just um, sort of PHI in the equation here. Um, and then also, you know, just just the importance of it feeling like a like an app that and a the product that knows who they are and is serving their needs specifically sort of came through in, in the design and personalization emphasis here, just making sure it really felt like a useful tool that was catering to them specifically in their needs. <clears throat> um, and, and, you know, one of the things we definitely wanted to learn considering the timing of this research was just what impact did COVID-19 have or it continues to have on, on this population and population in general. And so we asked, you know, did you start using new tools, new features, new mobile apps um, for the first time during the pandemic? Um, and there's a, uh, you know, a pretty sizable chunk here, about a third that said, yep, I absolutely started using something new during the pandemic to help manage my care and just interact with my provider. <clears throat> and then coupled with that, uh, we, we wanted to know, okay, was that a sort of thing where you downloaded at one time because you thought it would be useful and then you stopped using it or was it really just a, a specific uh something really specific tied to you know COVID information when we were in the thick of that uh but what we learned was kind of interesting that the majority um the overwhelming majority of folks who who started using a tool or a mobile app during uh, the course of the pandemic have largely stuck to it and kept using these tools because they found them find them to be useful they find them to improve their ability to interact and engage with their providers and um, you know that was good to know as well here as we think about what to invest in and um, what to what considerations go into adoption and thinking about people continuing to use um, an app like this <clears throat> we definitely wanted to dig in a little bit on the provider portal side of things the patient portal sorry the patient portal here um, and you know what when when folks think about using their patient portal, what stands out? You know, what are the what are the areas that could be better, could really help yield a better experience? And um, again, not a ton of really surprising things here, but it's helpful as we think about prioritization and what to focus on because the things that really came to the surface were should be really easy to use, should be easy to get in, log in, and access the information that I need. And then appointment scheduling, appointment scheduling, appointment scheduling, appointment scheduling <laughs> came up over and over again here. And that just really speaks to when folks are using a mobile application or mobile device or just their patient portal in general, they're expecting to be able to do those, those transactions that you know you, you would see in other sort of analogous technologies and in other industries where you, you get into a logged in experience, they know who you are and you're able to do the, the things that, um, you know, things like booking an appointment or um, or a stay at a hotel or that sort of thing really simply and easily, um, where in general that isn't super easy across a lot of the patient portal solutions that are out there today. <clears throat> and this is the last slide I'll hit on, on this stage or this section here before I hand it over to Christopher to talk a little bit about um, the, the Children's Wisconsin 
uh, piece of this specifically, but you know, when we talk about blockers or things that are inhibiting people using mobile devices, you just really wanted to understand what some of those things were that that stood out. Um, and and asking specifically, what healthcare tasks do you really wish were easier that you could do more regularly? And again, scheduling appointments comes to the top quite a bit here. But we also heard things like just being able to start to triage yourself uh, or or your family member when it comes to um, a specific you know illness or or problem that you're facing. So seeing symptom checkers and sort of tying that into the process uh, definitely came to the surface as well. So again, more interesting takeaways and things that helped us focus the effort and the investment, the resources as we got into the development uh, process. So, um, <clears throat> and by the way, I, I, I should also say that there's a lot more that we asked here. There's a lot more data that we compiled. This was just sort of the brief overview focused on this effort specifically, but if anyone's interested in diving deeper into this or hearing more about what, what we learned through the survey process, we'd be happy to take those questions separately or, or talk to you um, in another session. We'll have our contact information, I think, at the end of this presentation, so we can definitely get in touch to talk, talk more about that. So yeah, I think from here we'll jump into sort of the Children's Wisconsin case study stage of this. Uh, so Christopher, you want to take it from here? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll jump in and uh, like Bryce was sharing about kind of the, the industry research, um, we, we really started a lot of this process with, um, you know, kind of trying to identify what what problem we're trying to solve for our families uh, and why, why even build an app in the first place? Because I think we, we started with maybe a, maybe we don't need to do that. Maybe there's other uh, areas and kind of what what led us around to that, that um, decision. So Bryce, we're gonna go to the next slide. Um, so just, just from a um, level setting perspective about Children of Wisconsin, because it'll be important when you think about, um, when you see some of the features in the app is that uh, you know, Children of Wisconsin definitely goes well beyond uh, kind of the, the specialty care and kind of hospitalized patient area. We have a considerable presence in primary care, community health, um, you know, really looking kind of more broadly at the spectrum of, of health. So we're trying to do everything we can uh, to, to be that, that, that center and that hub for those families to, to make sure we're doing um, all we can to make the children uh, in Wisconsin the, the healthiest in the nation. So. Uh, you'll see a lot of these, you know, kind of themes as we go through everybody's relationship with Children's Wisconsin is a, is a little bit differently. You know, they may have uh, an acute kind of condition, maybe they're one of our heart care patients, uh, but, you know, many of them have um, a full swath of services, especially across um, uh, the, the multiple kids and their, their families. Um, I'm going to go to the next uh, slide, Bryce. So, um, when we think about, you know, to trying to identify what problem we're trying to solve, we, we really started back a couple of years ago and, and, and did um, a, a considerable amount of research and journey mapping with our families to say, you know, what is that process? And, and you know, we, we, we've all been sort of in that place if we've, we've got kids at home where, like, what do I do next, right? Like, this is a cough, this is something, you know, kind of what's this rash? How do I determine, you know, where do I go next? Do I call my pediatrician? Do I go to the urgent care? Do I rush to the emergency department? A lot of like, are, are each of our levels of anxiety plays into that as well. And, and what you see at the front end of this, this process is that families go through so many different twists and turns, right? They're, they're doing a lot of their own research. They're out on Google. They're calling grandma. In our research, almost everybody, it's sort of like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, everybody has a nurse friend somehow. And so regardless of whether they're trained in pediatrics or not, they're, they're often contacted in this, this process as well. And so we saw a lot of churn there and need for better resources um, for, for families. And then certainly as you get to kind of that, that scheduling experience, making sure that that's as frictionless as possible. So you see that the part that's highlighted actually in the middle of this graph is, is what happens in our doors, which is a very positive experience. That's when they get uh, access to um, somebody who can help provide them answers and, and, and empathize with them. And you see that kind of the emotional level uh, tick up. And what we're trying to look at is like across the entire journey, what are those areas we can do before and after visits uh, to really improve that experience? And that's really where, where the Children's Wisconsin app comes into play. 
if you go to the next slide, uh, the so one thing that we referenced in that in the journey uh, was the parent bag of tricks, and all of our bag of tricks is a little bit differently. But I mentioned Dr. Google. Certainly, people are out researching um, symptoms. They they have there's a number of different symptom checkers out in the industry. You have a nurse friend. You're sometimes you're using video visits. Oftentimes, you're out going into, you know, unfortunately to social media and asking everybody for validation. So we looked at all those things and say, all right, well, how do we how do we help organize this for families and get them to the uh, the right answers in the right way? Um, and um, so that that's you know kind of where how we started this process is like, can can the app be a, a source of that? Um, so if you go to the the next slide, the other thing that is important to us is that. Um, you know, I think a lot of us are caught in this position where, you know, we, we certainly all have uh, patient portals often provided by our um, EMR vendors, and uh, we don't have an opportunity to differentiate, right? As I mentioned at the beginning, you know, Children's Wisconsin has a very unique footprint. We have a very different relationship uh, with all of our families. We didn't want to look just like another, um, another kind of uh, floor on the elevator here, another kind of uh, a store in the mall. Uh, we really want to say, how can we um, kind of best represent our, our, our array of services to our families in a way that's understandable by them and, is, and doesn't feel technical or uh, obtrusive? So that's an important part of all of this, is just how do you represent your brand effectively in, in the market? Uh, because this is really, when you look on a day-to-day -day basis, even when we, we go to our public website, what's the most common task on your public website? Clicking on your patient portal, right? So this is what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We really need to uh, be able to, to have that, that conversation with our families. If you go to the next slide. Um, so that led us to our, our, our guiding principles when we started this process, is that we really wanted to have, give families a better experience and a deeper connection uh, to us overall. Um, by creating all those digital conveniences, like what Bryce mentioned, it's like they don't think about this as healthcare. They just think about it, you know, something else in their life. You know, whether it's the same as they book airlines or hotel or whatever it might be, they want this nice and simple and easy. Easy. Uh, the other thing that was important to us was that we, if they had established primary care with us, we really wanted to help them prioritize the the medical home and, and use your pediatrician as sort of your starting point in a lot of these. Uh, Conversations. We didn't want you going out to the, the area urgent care and having disconnected care as much as we could. Um, uh, we also wanted to focus on uh, communication and access overall. You'll see that a lot through the app of just how do we make it simpler to do business with children, uh, which in turn uh, leads to that operational efficiency, right? That you know, the more we're, we're offering self service uh, functionality, uh, we're, we're reducing the amount of phone calls that leads to, to less uh, burden on the staff and, and really leads to some of those, those operational goals as well. So net net, we're trying to improve the patient experience and the staff experience by introducing these, these type of tools. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we went through a number of different iterations as we, as we went through this. We, you know, obviously we, we sketched, we prototyped things. You'll see here, um, even in that first sketch, it was our old logo. We used to be called Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. It's been that long that we worked through this process to say, um, how do we create an experience that uh, families really enjoy? Um, and uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about, you know, I, I came from the software development um, world and there was always the discussion of MVP and I think MVP in this sense means like kind of what is market viable uh, not not what is minimally viable but in but what what makes families lives easier right like let's not launch it unless we've made their lives easier and uh, so we worked through a lot of the prototype uh, process and uh, really felt confident in the direction that we were going I uh, see one one quote down below it's, it's made by the people I trust to take care of the health and well-being of my children which is important for us, right? There may be uh, all the different players in the industry, you know, the Walmart health in the world, all sorts of, you know, startups that may offer other tools, but um, they won't offer the same level of care. And so we want to offer the, you know, the same conveniences that they had, but get them connected to the brand that they trusted. Christopher, I'm, I, we, we work with enough health systems that I think I have a pretty good feel for this being an area 
that a lot of people have questions about, a lot of people in your position or on teams thinking about this sort of product, whether it's an app or another digital product, it's just like how much research, how much of this type of work to do. And so I'm kind of curious, I know a little bit from our discussions, but I'm just curious, kind of curious your two cents quickly on, you know, I guess the amount of research and time that was spent thinking about this before, you know, frankly, we even got engaged in, in the conversation and then what you would recommend here for others thinking about this as they plan and just try to figure out the right way to approach product development here. Yeah, I, I think you know, I can't say enough about kind of leading through a, a good and thoughtful design process ahead of time because it will save you time and money in the end. Um, once you start getting to, to development, it, it becomes harder to pivot, right? As, as you start um, getting these requirements in and, and working on that. I think the other thing that it does is it really can clarify for you a lot of your, your, your goals and you'll learn a lot from your families. I think we, we shifted a number of different things. Even I'm just looking at the prototypes that we had in here. One of the first concepts we had was this idea of chat with children. That was going to be the right, like just come in and do that. And the more we dug into that, um, you know what, we found a simpler solution, right? Which is that text message works really great. It's equitable, it's it's universal, and we didn't necessarily need to embed everything into the app um, if we could kind of just get you connected to those. So you'll learn a lot that can can really guide uh, you you further in the process. So yeah, yeah don't, don't skip this part of the process. <laughs> my impression is that a lot of the low fidelity prototyping and design work that was done helped guide a lot of those decisions, right? And then was interesting was that you couple that with once we did get into development, we quickly found out some technical constraints, right? That led to pivots, you know, smaller pivots perhaps on where we go with this functionality. So it's a little bit of a, it's a balancing act, right? Between um, spending a ton of time visioning, but also wanting to quickly get to some of those decisions before you even start development, which to your point is, is expensive. Yeah, that's a great point. And like, you, you definitely want that um, technical gut check throughout the process because you can you can design things to your, your heart's desire and come up with the most amazing things that may or may not be possible. So you have to have some grounding um, in, in what, what might be uh, available too. Yeah. yeah, we'll hit on that a little bit more later when we talk about the, yeah, the patient portal integration piece of this. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so where, where we ended up in this process, and these are, um, I think, screenshots directly from our app store, uh, is that, you know, really found something that integrated kind of all of our scheduling experience, um, our symptom checking, right? So our ability to help guide our families to find out what the right side of care is for them. What we weren't trying to get to is like a diagnosis from a symptom checker, the, the amount of questions and process that needed to get to that. And that's honestly not what a lot of our families were looking for. They were they they're trying to, to judge like, how worried should I be, right? They're, and uh, should I be heading right to the emergency room? Do I have a day to wait on this, right? And so that that's the level of guidance that we were trying to provide. Uh, we also found it very important. We have a very high uh, patient portal adoption rate, and we heard loud and clear from our families of give us everything that you've got in there, right? We don't want like a subset of this, otherwise we're going to continue to use the patient portal separately, uh, and we won't use your app. And we found that, frankly, previously. We've, we've had, um, you know, symptom checking apps out for a few years. They never really gained adoption because they weren't uh, integrated experience for our families. If you just keep telling them, Here's a visit, video visit app, here's a symptom checking app, here's your wayfinding app, and download all 10 of them and you'll have your experience with children's. That's not gonna be good enough, right? They, they want this really as one. And you see this with any major brand, you know, you, you, you've got your Starbucks app, your Marriott app, right? They're just, they're all one for that brand as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so there, there's obviously a lot that went into <laughs> getting to this point so but i think we're reserving a fair bit of that because we're going to do a, a live demo here as part of the conversation which i guess we could have mentioned at the at the onset here but <laughs> but yeah it's uh, going to be pretty exciting Hope, hopefully everything will work super smoothly but yeah we're going to dig in a lot more into the details of the execution and and some of the decisions therein in that section of this but before we get there wanted to hit on a few of just kind of like the pretty big foundational decisions or considerations that we had to think about 
um, from a technology point of view and also to, to an extent to, from a functionality point of view. So talking about a few of these and then we'll then we'll talk uh, results and then and then get into the demo. Um, <clears throat> but one of the first big ones, and you alluded to this a little bit, Christopher, earlier as you were talking about the, the strategy from a children's Wisconsin point of view is, you know, how do you think about, in your case, the the, the EMR vendors Epic and <clears throat> the therefore the patient portal solution is my chart. So so the question was, how do you leverage my chart here and to your, when you were talking about the directory and differentiation i think that was sort of a key decision point here and do you just go with the out of the box my chart solution and present that as many health systems do and you know there's really no or very little differentiation there um or do you go uh, a more customization route so when we it's interesting when you in this scenario with a patient portal solution being the underpinnings of this type of, of app, you're really in a build versus sort of rent situation, right? Uh, or I feel like you and I both like that that analogy here better than, than the classic build versus buy, where you're gonna either invest and build something truly proprietary um, that from the ground up, uh, or you're, ba you're, you're leaning on <clears throat> a, a vendor solution like MyChart that you are paying for, um, as part of that uh, sort of broader relationship with that vendor, but at any point they, you know, that could go away, uh, you know, based on the contract, I suppose. And then also, uh, you're really at the mercy of their roadmap, their plans, their updates, all of those sort of things. So you really have very little control in that scenario over the product itself and the ability to differentiate it. <clears throat> um, so, uh, the I, I guess. This is very. This slide makes it very binary. Um, where we ultimately landed was a little bit in between these two, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I don't know if you have anything to add here, Christopher, before I get into that. No, I think I think you said it, Bryce. I mean, the, the reason we like that kind of rent analogy is you have to think about how much influence you have over your landlord, right? Is that you know, in varying relationships that we all have this with you know, with vendors or software that we use, you know, maybe you have an ability to to customize it, maybe you don't, right? And so. Um, you just have to be really careful about what are the things that really uh, you, you hold to be kind of the most important and where do you want to differentiate and that's really where, where you have to focus your time and energy. Well, we as health systems don't have enough resources to, to do this all ourselves, right, and, and to build everything build from scratch so software. Um, so we have to, it has to be a balance between them, but you have to pick carefully um, on how you do that. Yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of which, the... So that, that sort of once you decide generally which which path you're you want to go down, the next question becomes, okay, how how do we get there? How do we how do we lever, leverage my chart in this case? Or really, I think this is analogous for any patient portal type integration with a product like this. Um, but really, with with my chart at least, there are sort of three different potential approaches here when we talk about integration with that product and and leveraging it. So first is just the, the simplest path, which is taking some of your 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 brand colors and your logo and the uh, simplest form of integration here and applying that to pretty much the standard my chart out of the box mobile application. Um, <clears throat> the second option is what is called hybrid, which is basically trying to get the best of both worlds, you know, really leveraging my chart pretty heavily in terms of the code and not re not having to reinvent or redevelop the functionality that that lives in my chart but also being able to apply some custom uh custom in interface on top of that and also add in other functionality like a good example i think would be the symptom checker and some of the other more uh specific things that you'll cover in the demo uh, christopher but layering on other stuff or on top of or around surrounding my chart and then the third the third uh option here to the far right is really the the full build version of this if you're going to take an approach you said you know we want to build something completely proprietary we want to own every aspect of it um it is an option you can tr you can treat <clears throat> the patient portal really is just a data source and leverage APIs and other you know services and other ways to get that data into a completely custom built interface that is really resource heavy and requires a lot of sort of that that pathway requires you to 
be and act and operate like a, like a software development company, as Christopher mentioned in the last slide. So if you're going to go that path, it's really, you know, you have to be thoughtful about how you're going to approach it and how you're going to organize and structure yourself to be prepared for that endeavor and the long-term um, ownership of that product, making sure it, it can stand up over time. Um, and yeah, so basically, you know, with, with the branded option, you're really just taking a licensed off the shelf product and putting it out there. Um, whereas in the far right, it, the, the good news, the, pro, the positive is that it's a fully owned, you know, sort of capitalized asset for, for your organization that you own all the IP for and can manage and, and leverage going forward. The, 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 the con is, is the cost side of doing that, taking that approach. So we landed, we landed really in the middle here. And I think generally are feeling pretty good about that decision. Um, <clears throat> so, so once you have sort of hashed out how you want to manage the, the patient portal integration, the other or one of the remaining big decisions is just what technology do we want to leverage here? In our case, you know, in our case, we, we went the hybrid path here uh, with, with Children's Wisconsin. So that means there needs to be some additional technology on top of what my chart provides via their their SDK and, and their API. So um, the app itself here is built in a cross-platform framework, which gives us, um, generally speaking, a single code base to, to worry about across both the Android and iOS landscapes, which is great, lowers the maintenance cost a little bit, only having to deal with one code base. Um, the one caveat to that is when you're leveraging the SDK that that my chart gives you that SDK is actually there's there's specific code for Android native Android and specific code for native iOS so you are handling a little bit of that specific native code from an SDK point of view with my chart but everything else that you're going to build in there on top of that can be one single code base which is nice um, in in this case we went with a, a technology called ionic um, for the for the cross-platform framework to, to give us that one single code base uh, part of that was because of just the, the the common technologies that it's you can leverage within ionic um, and the ease of being able to layer in the the native SDK components as well um, and you know one of the big decisions that you can make here is do we go cross-platform versus building two separate native apps one for iOS and one for Android and by and large where it, it seems to be in our in our experience from from our seat very rare that organizations are going the full native approach because maintenance costs are maintenance costs are really high in that case um, and though you do get the closest to the experience you would get with any other, um, you know, native iOS application or native Android application, there's very few use cases that really require that. You know, that sort of like deep hardware integration or integration with something else that iOS gives you exclusively or or Android, where you would be required to go that native path. So by and large, I think most organizations here are making the decision to go cross-platform for the technology selection, whether it's something like Ionic or a React Native or a Flutter, or, you know, it could go on and on. There are a number of options, and really that's just about weighing, um, you know, the factors that are most important to you in terms of the development, what your resources are in-house, who you're working with to develop the application, and, and so on. <clears throat> So with that, I just want to, I think we want to just hit on a couple of sort of outcomes and things that we're seeing with the app so far in terms of just data and tracking progress. Uh, and, and then we'll, and then we'll get into the demo. So um, from a measuring success point of view, you know, we, we're keen in on several different things, I think from a, from an ROI and just trying to get a sense of how successful the app is being, right, Christopher. So um, a few things that we're mentioning here specifically on the slides, we have maintained a really high just sort of uh, consumer rating in the app stores from since we launched the app back in in March of of this year, and um, that's been really great to see. People who are using the app are rating it pretty highly, and I think generally in the in the five. I think we we still are at five stars on in in the iOS app store, the Apple app store, and yeah. in 4.8, 4.9 4 range in the on the Google Play Store side of things. Um, which is that is great because that's you know validation from the from the users themselves and then in terms of just usage uh, we're up over 80,000 sessions since it really uh, went into the market in March 
and it's cool to see some of the features and Christopher will explore this a little bit in the demo but there's some specific kind of unique features of being able to add and add clinics and, and, and interact and sort of personalize your experience in the application and we've seen pretty good uptake of that which was a hypothesis right going into it that that would be something based on all the user, user testing and uh, prototyping that, that would be something people would really use and engage with and that seems to be, be proving out to be true here so far. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the other outcome metrics here on the right and how you're thinking about it at an organizational reporting level, Christopher? Yeah, I think the um, I alluded to these, but when you think about the why, why are we trying to get so many of our families into here other than being really proud of what we built, right, is the, again, of the, um, what does it lead to long term, right? There's the, you know, operational efficiency. We, we have very aggressive goals around what we want to do from a scheduling and self-service perspective there um, because we hear it day in and day out from our patient comments of like, just make this easy on me, right? Like just, just you know, remove some of the friction from scheduling. Similarly with check-in, um, everybody hates repeating themselves, right, in healthcare and it happens all the time, right? So the more we can get you just to answer some of those questions ahead of time, you know, when you're at home on your phone, answer some questionnaires so that when you come, you spend really maximizing the time you have in conversation with your care team. But then from a patient experience perspective, uh, certainly the, uh, we look at something like customer effort score, just like how easy is it to do business with us and, and how, how can this help influence that along with uh, our net promoter score um, work as well. And then from a, you know, a clinical outcome perspective, uh, the other thing that we're, we're looking to do is, is really reduce some of those avoidable ED visits. You hear about it so often where you know, you go with a, a relatively mild condition and wait for a couple hours in the ED because you're, you're behind appropriately a number of more severe uh, cases. So we, that was where we started some of our research process is just like getting people to the right side of the right care uh, at the right time. And uh, so these are always harder, right? They're indirect measures to say, all right, this app directly lifted this. We can see a lot of the correlation, right? The, the app users you know, tend to be more engaged. They schedule at a higher rate. They check in at a higher rate, right? And we're getting them. But um, that gives you a sense of from a business perspective of what we're, we're trying to, to influence as well. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I mentioned this earlier, but just a few things that I think anyone we we think anyone should be considering or thinking about if they're going down uh, this path or building a product like this. You know, first, it, it, and this is a lesson that, that we've learned over and over again on the Modia side is with a mobile app like this, or really any mobile app that you're developing, the earlier the earlier you can get it into the app store for getting through the those stores approval process, the better. Even if you don't have the full featured market ready app that Christopher spoke about earlier, you can still submit a version of your application early in the process that has enough of the functionality to be able to facilitate the review process. Apple in particular, the first time you put a product into their store in that process can take quite a long time. Um, so <clears throat> getting quickly to a foundational level app that you can then submit for that approval is great because you get over that potentially month long process. And then from there, it, they treat it as an update. So it's much faster. They look at it quickly. It's much easier to just kind of get through the process. So if you know you're going to launch in eight months, but you can start that, you can get a first pass into the app store for approval four months in, that's going to pay dividends down the road. Um, because it's really just time you're sitting around waiting for Apple to get back to you or Google to get back to you in those cases. Um, so that's, that's a big de definite sort of recommendation or takeaway here. Um, you know, one of the things, this wasn't an issue or anything for us uh, here with Children's Wisconsin, but just a good thought is planning your measurement strategy from the start, making sure you know, going back to the previous slide, the, the stuff that Christopher talked about, this, the, th the things that are going to be mission critical, making sure you have a, a measurement plan, a strategy for how you're going to track those things. And if you already have an app in market, potentially, even if it's the MyChart, just the standard MyChart app, looking at whatever metrics you can in terms of the what the existing experience is yielding so that you can do good com comparison post go live of the new application. Um, technical capabilities, this is a big one. So <clears throat> once you decide which path you're gonna go um, down in terms of integration with MyChart and um, 
and you know the tech stack that you're going to use testing those things early in the process as early as possible is really critical because what we've found time and time again is you might get us a certain ways into the development and realize you're going to hit a brick wall because of either something that you can't do from an epic point of view or your your ehr point of view or um you know just another technical hurdle that's going to be really challenging to get over in the time frame that you're in so this that's where i think that that sort of mvp piece really plays in the faster you can start to build stuff and test some of those hypotheses from a technical point of view the, the better um and then lastly this is more of a this is more of a takeaway and you can speak to this as well christopher but like from it once you get an app in market keeping in lockstep with the evolution of my chart if you're if you're using the sdk driven approach or really any of these any of the pathways it's really critical to work with your internal um sort of my chart or patient portal owner as well as the epic uh representatives to make make sure you just know what that cadence is know what's coming in terms of the quarterly updates or other sort of incremental updates so that nothing breaks down from uh, an app point of view as those happen because they will make changes they will update the sdk they will update apis along with those upgrades and, and changes over time so you just have to be really prepared for that and it's really just a communication thing i think mostly right christopher it's just it's just being really clear on identifying who those folks are that you need to stay close with and having a good plan for what that communication is going to look like. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's not so much the the technical lift. I mean, the doing the the SDK updates is word sometimes it's got it's it's also knowing the um uh, the release uh, like notes and what's coming and what you might need to activate around and, and so just yeah really communicating around that um, on, we do that ours on a quarterly basis I know other institutions might uh, take different intervals but that just keeps us always up to date and, and on top of things yep all right I think it's demo time so right. um, I guess let me know when you're ready and queued up on your site Christopher and I'll pass the presenter rights to you yeah um one second yeah you can go ahead all right all right are you seeing my screen effectively i can i can see it just fine okay great this is always a little bit dicey demoing from your personal cell phone but uh i will uh, I wanted to share the, the real product rather than sharing any sort of screenshots uh, in this webinar as well. And you certainly are all welcome to go get this from the App Store. As you as you see uh, here, they, there is a lot of features that you don't need a Children's Wisconsin account to, to use, and you can continue without logging in. And that was one of our design principles as we built this app was to, to really um, make sure that uh, you know, especially when you think about things like, you know, how are you getting access to same day care? Or how are you going into the urgent care? A considerable amount of our uh, traffic into the urgent care is families that may or may not have uh, a relationship already with Children's Wisconsin. And we want to make sure that that path is as frictionless as possible. Uh, we also want to provide tools like our symptom checkers and our, our video visit capabilities to the broader community and not just those that have previously had a visit or have a patient portal account. So definitely something to think about from your your guest strategy perspective the um so i'll continue without logging in here and you'll see here just how this this per, uh, experience can be personalized uh, to each individual uh user so at the top of the screen uh we we have the capability certainly now we're in uh flu shot season so we're, we're actively running a, a campaign here to make sure that we're uh catching them at multiple different areas that as they log into the app uh, they give them the ability to schedule directly and get that flu shot or, or COVID-19 vaccine um, uh, scheduled for, for them, their family. Um, you'll, as I scroll down the page here, you'll see at the top, um, I, in this case, I have an established uh, relationship. Um, and this is my, my primary care provider, uh, along with the, the clinic that, that she practices at. And I have the ability directly and to deep link in here and schedule um, with that provider. This is something that we heard so often with our families is we really want to see all this in context, make it easy uh, to, to get in touch with my um, my clinic, my pediatrician, have the ability certainly to, to call directly from here or uh, in our case, uh, text as well. So if we go to text into here, this will actually help 
uh, educate our families on, on what are the, the appropriate ways that, that you can uh, text or what should you be texting for. I will say that I was a skeptic at first of the what is your fax number <laughs> reason, and I wouldn't know you wouldn't believe how often that might come up. So that was actually turns out to be a top reason that people are texting uh, our clinics. And I will say text messaging in general has been a uh, massive success with our clinics. It, it adds to so much uh, clinical efficiency, and it's something that uh, families, especially as we get um, uh, to, to younger families and, and, and kind of um, different generations like that. It's just like, that's how people prefer to communicate. Me personally, that's how I prefer to communicate. Um, and and then we have the ability to, like I said, schedule directly there as well. Now, not all families are going to have uh, our primary care. So they also have the ability to, to really layer in here their specific specialty care. I'll show how you personalize this of um, you know what's what what are you looking to do? Are you making to, uh, you want to uh, get a visit request? Do you want to call that clinic? Uh, do you want to um, you know just find ways of, of uh, sending them a message? And and that might be the way that they they have their relationship with childrens. Um, and then at the bottom of the page here is really where we talked about that that parent ba bag of tricks. Like how do I know I'm doing the best thing as a parent for my child? How do I know I'm getting to the right? site of care. So you see here listed all of our same day care options, everything that you have beyond certainly what we had at the top of the page around scheduling either your um, medical home and your primary care doctor. We also have the ability for you to go and book your spot, reserve your spot on, online for the urgent care. Um, go and conduct an urgent care video visit directly within the app. Uh, this is something that previously uh, I'm sure like many of you, we had a standalone vendor uh, to do this in the standalone app. And that was, uh, it took a lot of time and energy and marketing to convince families to go uh, download and, and use those video visits. Since we've launched through this app and having the integrated video visit, our volumes have more than doubled um, in our urgent care video visit um, workflow. And our net promoter scores there are very high, 90 plus in the urgent care video visit realm. One thing we're also very proud of um, having launched in the last year is a mental health walk-in clinic. Um, this is a big, big need in our community and I'm sure across the nation. And it gives them now the ability to go and reserve a spot online um, directly at, uh, into that app. This is happens to be a, a, a type of care that you, you don't necessarily want to be waiting in a waiting room and, and kind of doing a kind of straight walk-in. So having like a, a scheduled spot uh, for that clinic uh, helps a great deal. And then uh, certainly um, if they're, you're needing to go to the emergency room. The really great thing about this too, as we get down in the parent tools here, you see the symptom checker is, that's all integrated now too. So that instead of just going to the symptom checker and saying, here's what you should do next, if it says go, go have an urgent care video visit at the end of the symptom checker, we're, we're taking you directly into that experience. We don't have to tell you to go find another app or call some number to do it. Um, one of the most popular features on the app, again, an area where, you know, it's sometimes it's simpler things is the dosage tables. Uh, just understanding when you're converting things uh, for different sizes, weights of children, that you've got those dosage tables all kind of uh, uh, present in the app. So whether it's, you know, look, at, I'm just looking at Tylenol. This is one of the more used features in the app is just trying to understand, am I doing the right thing? Am I giving them the right amount of dosage? So just kind of quick, easy access. Um, and then first aid advice as well. So um, the the other thing I mentioned at the beginning was that we really want to make this accessible uh, to, to families, whether they have a MyChart account or don't. And so when you see here, when I go in, uh, say I want to schedule an urgent care visit, I can choose to continue without logging in. Certainly there, you know, just from an ease of scheduling, it's a little bit easier if you just log in because we can pre-populate some of that information uh, for you. So we do nudge them, uh, but we don't require you to, to do that when you, when you make some of these transactions. So that meant that we have to have both interfaces uh, in here. We have to you know, have the, the guest scheduling experience and the, the authenticated scheduling experience, but you do see a pretty even split on a number of these. If I were to go uh, log in as well, um, about two thirds of our families use biometric devices. You won't be able to see these parts because it's gonna Okay, there we go, because <laughs> it, uh, it removes that from view. But then you can see I can select directly one of my children. 
and and go directly in there. I won't take you into my actual my chart account uh, for for anonymity reasons. And um, so you'll see that kind of all uh, personalized in here. I can also click into these individual clinics, um, learn more about kind of um, you know how to properly send information, get uh, uh, um, uh, directions into the clinic. Uh, we also um, look to integrate that with our wayfinding app um, and get you like if it's on camp on, on our main campus, uh, getting you directed uh, th directly to the front door of that um, as well. And then uh, we do we did a lot of work here to make sure that we're helping families differentiate what should be a my chart. Uh, message you can send a message through my chart uh, versus a, a text to the clinic and I will say that um, families just intuitively understand that and we, we don't get clinical questions in uh, very often to our text messaging uh, services um, so the, the other aspect of personalization here is that I mentioned before that I can add my own uh, clinics and relationships so if I have additional specialty care clinics that I'm working with I can add those um, into here uh, we also have the ability then um, to have those by QR code add directly. So if I'm in the um, you know primary care and I'm, I'm sitting with that provider, I can add them without me having to do that um, uh, directly. Um, we do not pull that information over from Epic because there's a lot more in a care team than maybe what the family is looking to personalize around. Um, and so they can they can do that uh, directly in the app. I can also look and integrate back and, and uh, search for other services so search for other providers locations um, i can have quick links here to you know like i mentioned before schedule immunizations schedule baseline concussion test um, all kind of um, directly uh, from the app uh, this was this involved another integration point um, where we actually pulled this directly uh, from um, we made a service from back to our public website so that we don't have to update uh, this information uh, in two places. So these, the you know, the provider photo there, the name, the clinics are all pulled in dynamically. So we're not relying upon an app release uh, to do those type of things. And then uh, on the my chart tab, I will say that that you know that is the full version of my chart and embedded with that SDK as Bryce mentioned earlier, <laughs> and uh, that really provides families with a lot of the familiarity that they they had in the past of using that my chart account. And we heard that loud and clear from our families of don't don't change everything all at once for me, <laughs> right? Like I'm familiar with this, I know how to get to things. You know, if you can make ways to make it a little bit easier, like we have here, where we're deep linking into certain uh, features and, and simplifying it, do that. But but also like, uh, you know, too much change could be a little bit overwhelming. So with that, I'm just going to uh, stop there. Uh, like I said, you're welcome to, to uh, download the app and provide us more feedback. But uh, it gives you a sense of, of just all the, the work that that's gone into that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Christopher. That was great. Uh, I think that's pretty much it in terms of the presentation today. So we want to jump into some Q&A now, Brian. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I've got a couple here. Um, some you guys went over a little bit, some we may touch on again here on this and go into a little bit more depth. Uh, there was a good one in the chat that is, uh, besides branding, what was the main feature delta between the Epic provided app? So that's kind of probably a little tough one. Um, but I think, Christopher, we probably covered a fair bit of that in the demo, really, because pretty much everything you demoed is not a MyChart feature, other than some of the deep linking that you mentioned. And what we what we did was we pretty put pretty much put all of the Epic provided MyChart app in that MyChart tab and said, oh, here's all the MyChart stuff. The good news is you don't have to log in multiple times to do anything in the app. So there's definitely a great sort of single sign-on experience, but pretty much everything you step through with the adding clinics and the dosage tables and the urgent care visits and the video visits and all that stuff um, is, is really outside of what my chart does by default, correct? Cor correct, yeah. I think like the easiest way to think about that is everything you do outside of an authenticated experience, which is like your public presence to the world is, is outside of that. So um, it allowed us to consolidate down. We, we used to have, an, like I mentioned, a symptom checker app, a video visit app, right? You know, we had 
so all these different things, right? Like, and so we, we've, we've been able to eliminate those and bring those all together into one experience. Yeah, very cool, thank you. Also, I will mention that we're not gonna be able to get to all these questions in the next five minutes. I will make sure to get everyone's questions answered and we'll follow up. Um, and just, I just wanted to let, let everybody know that. Um, let's see, another one. Did you roll out the app prior to any Epic integrations? If so, were uh, what were the biggest takeaways for having a successful integration? Yeah, th this particular app we rolled out um, with Epic directly in, in the first release of it. I, I think we had some experience of having non-Epic integrated apps in the past, and um, it, I will say that it takes a heck of a lot more marketing time and effort to, to try to get family and just change to say, download this one and then download this one and have all these sort of independent things. And a lot of the, the need was in having things all put together as much as possible. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, I always like these kind of questions. So during the process, what obstacle surprised you the most and how did you overcome it? <laughs> yeah, Bryce hit on some of these, right? Like as we, in the lessons learned a little bit, the, um, the submission of the app store process um, can take a while and it also can be a little little unpredictable um depends on who's your who's reviewing your app at any given moment um and so definitely get on top of those things early um also like um just really trying to to do some technical due diligence um on, on some of these features early is a is a big need we, we changed a lot of what how we thought about um our scheduling experience. We were actually going to make a fully custom scheduling experience and we found out we could do 85% of that with a much lower lift, right? If we just found a, a, a slightly different technical solution. So it's exploring your options there early is, is really helpful. Yeah, the, the, the only thing I would call out in addition to that, both of those I would definitely second, but the other thing was just, Took, it takes a little bit to get just the the my chart piece of it off the ground you know getting access just getting simply getting access to the stk and getting over the sort of overhead associated with starting the process and 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 just get, being able to get it up and running so another thing i would encourage everyone is to like start that part of the process as early as possible you know connect with epic talk about what you, you're trying to do here, begin the process of getting access to those SDKs, signing whatever agreements you need to sign and do all of that before your your official project plan has begun because otherwise you're just gonna be eating into your your runway. <clears throat> yeah, and I think that, that kind of segues into another question too, and I know there's no way to really pinpoint this, Bryce, but uh, the question is how long does launching an app take and do you recommend launching an MVP first and then enhancing it as you go? I think I think it would be fair to say, Christopher, you and I are on the same page that the second part of that question is yes. Think about your I like the term you used, market viable product approach um, <clears throat> and and really get something out there that's going to add value for your customers as as sort of minimal as that can be and then go from there. And that's generally the approach that we took here. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think, uh, sorry, remind me what the first part of that question was, Brian. <laughs> How long does it take? Oh, yeah, yeah, timeline. That's hugely variable depending on on what specifically you're trying to build and how much of that is already sort of ready to go as you get into that process. I think for us generally, having done this several times, the minimum timeline tends to be in the sort of six to eight months range, start to finish. Uh, I forget exactly where we landed, Christopher. It was in like the eight to ten months range, I want to say, from when we really meaningfully kicked things off to getting it in the hands of customers. Yeah, I think that's about right. But um, not all, most of that is not a development time. As we talked about earlier, a lot of it is this early design phase and making sure that you've got that. Um, so, yeah, and, and don't skip that part in the process. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Uh, were you able to bring in real-time data for scheduling? Yeah, yes, yeah, it, um, it it integrates directly back and and gets kind of that, that scheduling information um, um, of what's available for those providers um, real-time. Awesome. 
and we're we're now at two o'clock. Laura, I don't know if you want to chime in on um, probably at a stopping point now, but like I said, everyone that asks questions, I will make sure uh, I've got your names in the questions, and I will make sure that they're answered by Christopher and Bryce, and I will make sure to send those back to um, to you on that one since we are at two o'clock now. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank um, you, Christopher and Bryce for being here and a special thanks to Modia for sponsoring. So please remember there's a brief survey following this webinar and I hope you guys have a great afternoon. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks Christopher.